Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the Shochenko Scientific Society's uh, panel discussion. Uh, my name is Mark Jan Dubchansky, and I am an administrative associate at Entisha. And um, this uh, my is name is Mark Jan Dubchansky, and I am an administrative associate at Entisha. And um, this uh, my name is Mark Jan Dubchansky, and I am an administrative associate at Entisha. And um, this uh, my name is Jan Dubchansky, and I am I, an if, um, if somebody has their, uh, let me see, I'm gonna try to meet you all just for a second here before we get started. So um, it sounds like somebody had their um, YouTube channel open while um, we were doing this so that the streaming uh, collected my voice uh, several times. So I've just gone ahead and muted all the panelists. Um, let me, let's try that again. Uh, welcome everyone to the Shochenko Scientific Society, um, May 14th. Uh, this roundtable is called Ukrainian Culture in the West, its visibility, problems, and challenges. Um, and uh, we have uh, a great uh, panel for you today, um, which is in some ways a continuation of the discussion that was started um, on April 29th at the Shochenko expertise -thon. Um, where uh, we discussed the place of Ukrainian culture, the problems of, of Ukrainian culture, um, how it's understood in the West, and why it is understood in uh, certain ways that, that it is. And um, we have uh, four uh, august members of uh, Enta Shah with us today who all have expertise in uh, various areas of the arts and in culture. And we are very pleased um, to bring you a kind of a continuation of uh, some of the issues that were raised uh, during the, the expertise -a today. So um, our first speaker uh, will be Virko uh, Ballet, um, who is a, a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Uh, he is also a renowned composer, conductor, and pianist, and a former longtime conductor of the Las Vegas Symphony Orchestra. Um, he received the Shuchenko State Prize of Ukraine in 1996, and he is the author of two operas and two symphonies and more than 65 instrumental and vocal works. Uh, the opera Holodomor, Red Earth Hunger, premiered in 2013 and has been performed on the stages of New York City, Las Vegas, and Kyiv. And he has also uh, composed the music for the films The Swan Lake Zone, which was in 1990, and Prayer for Hetman Mazepa which was in 2001. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Professor Ballet to, um, to speak to us for about 10 to 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And um, then I'll pass it on to our next speaker and we'll have a discussion at the end. Okay, thank you. Go, go ahead, Yoko. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. And I think uh, what I want to start the discussion is something that we just sort of touched on, which is why this whole thing is such a surprise to the, for the world. In other words, what happened in Ukraine is a bombshell. And the question that I ask myself is why it is so. I'm probably the oldest one here, I think. I'm not going to ask Miroslava whether she beat my 84, but nevertheless, um, I, uh, I came to this country in 1949, and I was faced with much of a dilemma anytime I said I was Ukrainian. The reply of most people would be something along the line, oh, the Texas of Russia. Um, and the question was, why was it so? What was the reason for that? And uh, so we, moved, we lived in Los Angeles, and I was very much part of the Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, I had a pretty good memory in those days. I don't know, so I'm going to use some notes. You'll have to forgive me for that. And uh, so I used to appear on the various Narodny Svyata, national holidays. <clears throat> I very quickly realized that most national holidays, with the exception of figures like Sochenko, which was 
dedicated to the artists, but the political ones were basically about failures, not about successes, but basically about failures. And that, for a while, I accepted as still worth celebrating. To try is important. But eventually, I started feeling that there was something wrong as to why these constant failures occurred, of course, until we get into the recent times. But I think the reason was that the propaganda machine, which we have to see as a political tool from Russia, overwhelmed the world. Basically, the world saw Russia as the most important part in Eastern Europe. Uh, you will notice that most universities have as title Russian and Eastern European studies. So it's, it's, it's part of a, an image. And this image is very, very important. And the image is always political. We cannot disassociate politics from the image. I think it's very important. There is one reason when Poland became Poland again after World War I, they chose as its first president Paderewski, who was an internationally known pianist. He probably wasn't a very good politician, but he was a name. He was a symbol. And that drew people to, oh yes, Paderewski. And I think to some extent that's important. And we got to understand that. Um, so my thinking was to try to research as much as I could what was the primary reason for that? And where does it stem from? And I ran across <clears throat> an article by an English journalist, Lancelot Lawton, who made a speech to the House of Commons in 1935. This was already after Holland. And we have to remember then another British citizen was the one who first told the truth about Holland. But anyway, Lawton, among other things, said the following thing. The, quote, the deliberate policy of Russia was to avoid and discourage mention of Ukraine abroad. From the Middle Ages down to the 18th century, Ukraine figured largely in European literature. But after the first half of the 19th century, the West was made to forget that there was even such a nation. That so little has been heard of it is not surprising, for suppression of Ukrainian nationality has been persistently accompanied by ob obliteration of the very word Ukraine and concealment of the very existence of Ukrainians. It constitutes one of the major political deceptions of history. Now, we know, of course, that one way to erase that name, Ukraine, was to call us little Russians. <clears throat> and it doesn't take a great, great deal of intelligence to suppose that the name little Russians has a derogatory call to it. And uh, that was done on purpose. I don't think there's any particular case that can be made that it wasn't. It was done on purpose. Now. This continued throughout, and I think it's important for us to understand that. Henry Kissinger, in 2014, when the Donbass war started, waved off Russian invasion. Quote, Ukraine is an integral part of Russia, end of quote. In lockstep with Russia trumpeting the existence of Ukraine as, quote, a disorder of the mind, end of quote. Let's not forget that. Then Condoleezza Rice, who's supposedly a big Russian expert, wrote that for Russia, quote, losing Ukraine was like the US losing the original 13 colonies. OK, that gives us, I think, a certain kind of parameters for us to begin to think as to why. But I have to confess to you that I felt that the Ukrainians in this diaspora did not take 2014 
all that seriously as a political action. In other words, I didn't see a great deal being done by the intellectuals here to present this case to the politicians, not to other intellectuals. The ones who make decision over our lives are not scholars, they're politicians. They determine the facts. They decide what is true and what isn't. And I think this is something we forget, that we, I think Ukrainians have made a problem with that. And I was trying to figure out other places. We fight over language, for instance, but I still haven't seen any good study to correlate Ukrainian problem with language, let's say it with Belgium, which also started a mini war, or the problem with Canada and uh, the French part, Quebec, and the English part, which also had a language difficulty. I think the fact that most countries tend to be either bilingual or multilingual should not be something we waste too much time on. We should develop our own, make it important to the local population, and not really worry too much who's speaking in what language at home. I, I think a lot of mistakes like that have been made, in my opinion. And I am not by any means suggesting that we forget about the Ukrainian language. Far from it. But I'm also suggesting to accept certain political realities. Because I think that that is very, very important for us to understand that. That some, somewhere along the line, we need to accept certain limitations that every country has. Every country is subject to them. So, even the United States has tangled occasionally with the idea of making English official language, and it really isn't. It is official de facto. And that is actually, in the end, the best way. We hope that that's where it's going to get to. So I started looking at thinking, well, what is it? Can we go to, when we go to another example of a situation similar to ours, which is to some extent non-existent politically, because Ukraine was not existing politically, in spite of being a member of the United Nations. Because it just didn't work. When the United Nations was being formed and Ukraine became part of it, the US State Department in 1948 said, quote, any long-term US policy must be based on their, Russian, acceptance and their cooperation. The Ukrainian territory is as much a part of their national heritage as the Middle West is of ours. During the 1912 US presidential campaign, Mick Romney identified Russia as America's greatest geopolitical foe, but still said in the Wall Street Journal the legitimacy of Russia's influence in Kyiv. So, we have to remember this is a present situation for us. It's a political situation. And to a certain extent, we have to follow, well, frankly, Russians' example of making art be a political weapon. That is, making people be interested emotionally in Ukraine. And so I think what I wanted to start with you today, at least some of it, discussion, is how to do that. Because I think the only way to do that is to make our political presence felt. I know we got a Washington group and so on and all of them, but they tend to be favoring only Republicans. And Republicans right now are frankly invaded by the right wing, the extreme right wing, who is absolutely pro-Putin. How did that happen? Well, the same thing that happened in the late 30s in the United States, when there was a very large contingent of politicians and everybody else, including the very famous Lindbergh, who were pro-Hitler. That should not surprise us, because the Germans were, did everything possible to politically influence American thought at that time, in every way, every way possible. So. Okay, here's the situation. So I started thinking about it. And then Zelensky made an interesting statement. He said, the Ukraine has to become 
a bigger, larger Israel, meaning it had to stand on its own two feet. And I thought, that's true. During the end of the 30s into World War II, the situation with the Jews was not unknown here. Just like the situation with the whole of the war was not unknown. But it was ignored. Frankly, ignored. There were individual attempts by people and they were helped by individual members of the various political organizations to bring more here. The famous example of the children, to bring the children here. There was also a ship called by an American writer, the Ship of Fools, that had Jewish immigrants who wanted to leave Germany and come to America. America did not accept them, did not let them off the ship. They went around, went to South America, the same thing happened. They returned to Hamburg. Most of them ended up in the camps and not killed outright. So that is the history. And what they found out then, that in spite of the fact, in spite of so-called control of a lot of money, as they would say, because Jews were known supposedly for that, which also is humbug, they needed to make themselves be felt politically. And one of the ways that they did it was to certainly say that in every aspect of American life, they had to have their members. Remember, until World War II, there was a quota. Uh, officially, no, but unofficially. How many Jews could study in universities, in the higher areas, master's doctoral degree? That, of course, ended after World War II. So the next thing was, we got to make this problem known. Remember something else. The creation of Israel, which was ultimately approved, whatever you think about it, is something else again. That's not my point here. But the United States did not vote for it. Stalin did. So what did they do to turn the United States to be the greatest friend of Israel? Part of it was emotional. Part of it was to create literature, to bring out the various artists, and of course, to some extent, Hollywood help, which was created, frankly, by Jewish immigrants, because the Gentiles thought it films was beneath them. It was populist art and should not be practiced by a gentleman. This is what they did. And one of the big events that occurred that really changed popular opinion, and I can talk about it because I was there at that point, time, was a book and a film called Exodus. This book was commissioned by a Jewish collective. They right away made it, and they wanted a popular book. Leon Oris was chosen, not a very good writer, but a good plot maker, interesting plots. And he again took the idea from this ship Exodus, which was bringing Jews into Palestine, but wasn't allowed to, to go there. In other words, the British were opposed to that. So the book was written, the film was was made by Otto Preminger. The hero of it was Paul Newman, and it was a huge success. Step by step, their importance became evident in America. And I'm suggesting that we have to begin to think in those terms a little bit. It's not going to happen overnight, and I know that. It's not going to happen in the next 10 years. It'll take at least 20 years. And I remember as a parting note right now, let me say the following. Right now, there is a big hopla in the academic world about the fact that they discovered that Putin, I have to say Putin because it's his decision, we're dealing with a dictator, gave a lot of money to Yale. 
They don't even give a lot of money to Yale. They give a lot of money all over the world. The fact that we have many, many all Russian concerts in Europe is not an accident. I agree with you. Russian music is very popular. And it correctly popular. But it's a little bit more than you would expect. All Russian programs are very, very popular and very dominant. There is a film on Gurdjieff, the famous Russian conductor, that shows his, him to be multi, multi-millionaire. He's been buying out property. Where did he get the money? Conductors get paid very well, but they rarely become millionaires. Putin has bought them, and he's buying American universities. And we are in a, this is going to be a big struggle for us to establish our legitimacy. I want to warn you all, it's not going to happen easily. The attacks will be there. Right now, they're not doing much of it because everybody's waiting with bated breath what's going to happen in Ukraine. But I'd like to make you aware of that, and I would be interested to know if we could spend a little time at least touching on this subject, how do we make? When we, for instance, bring in a Ukrainian film, this has been done, it's been done to Colombia, this been also shown at uh, Ukrainian uh, Institute of America. Is that the best way to do it? Or should we talk to a theater, a regular theater, and book it for, for a week and show it in a regular theater? When we talk about Ukrainian works being done, should it be done by Ukrainians or should we actually hire Americans to do it? I think these are questions that are really important to know. And also I think it's nice to have our own people and our immigrants performing. But I think it's more important to have Americans perform it. And it's more important for us to show the films to Americans rather than make him strictly a show for the diaspora. That is at least my thoughts. I think the money should be spent that way. The money should be spent also on finding talent and backing them, finding wealthy enough people who will underwrite someone's education with the condition that they work in certain areas for us, etc. I think we have a place to do that. I think Antisha is a place that should be involved with that. Little by little, again, I'm not saying overnight, but if we don't do that, we're going to remain in this little, what I call igloo, some others call it bubble. A bubble, you see what the outside works. An igloo, you see the light, but you don't see what outside works. And I think we don't really see how the outside works very well. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Virko. I really appreciate the uh, the uh, the importance of looking outward and of addressing a broader society in the U.S. Um, and I think that that's something that um, all of us can think about as we um, do our own um, work, both in culture and in, in scholarship. So let me now um, introduce our next speaker, um, and that is uh, Miroslava Mudrak. Um, Dr. Mudrak is a professor emerita in the hist history of art department at o the Ohio State University. Um, and her academic work focuses on the unfolding of modernism in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union in relation to the philosophical and stylistic developments of the West. Her primary interest is in the ideological discourses, socio-political influences and artistic practice within East European cultures that use modernity to signify national identity. Um, and currently she is working on several large projects, uh, including From the Lotus to the Sickle, The Art of Boris Kosaryev, The Symbolist Impulse, Sevalod Maksimovich and the Ukrainian avant-garde. And um, of course, um, Dr. Mudrak is, is well known as the author of uh, a book about Ukrainian modernism, uh, the new generation in U Ukrainian art. 
Um, so, Dr. Mudrak, um, looks like you've got your PowerPoint all set, so I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Marcan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. And you can see my screen, right? I can see it. Um, okay. I think all we're right. all set. <laughs> all right. It's been a, kind of a harrowing time with all these PowerPoints and webinars. So um, at this point, I'm ready to surrender. But given Virko's um, pep talk, it's impossible to surrender at this point. We just have to keep working. So thank you very much for all of you who have joined us today. Um, as Marquian mentioned at the outset, this is a continuation of the presentations that we made at the um, uh, Expertathon uh, that the Shevchenko Society had sponsored uh, a week or so ago. So I'm glad to, as it were, continue uh, with a subject that um, is very near and dear to me, that is uh, Ukrainian modernism in particular, but Ukrainian uh, art of the uh, 20th century and the 21st century now. So I titled my presentation today, Ukrainian Artists in the West, Issues of Attribution and Appropriation. Um, recently, it occurred to me that maybe identity is already a term that is passe, given the watershed ele element of the war, um, that perhaps now we just simply have to uh, focus our sights on um, projects, events, individuals uh, that really uh, support the fact that Ukraine uh, is a separate country, it's a separate culture, it's a separate people, and it has something to offer the world. So having said that, um, I'd like to pick up where I left off last time. I was talking about the international character of Ukrainian modernism uh, in the 1910s. And I had said that um, the way that uh, Western art was introduced to Ukraine was through uh, initially a traveling exhibition sponsored by uh, an Odessa born uh, sculptor, Volodymyr Izdebsky, who organized uh, two uh, salons, uh, two touring uh, exhibitions uh, that originated in Odessa. Uh, then moved on to Kyiv, then moved on to uh, Moscow, then moved on to Riga. So, and as part of this, these exhibitions, Ukrainian artists were front and center, particularly in the second salon. Uh, the first salon had uh, sponsored, had shown uh, to the public arts, uh, the painting of the French masters of the early 20th century. So I'm just showing you the catalog cover here. Uh, and two works, uh, one by Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky, the fact that he uh, uh, comes from Odessa, has, had studied in Odessa, is really kind of um, not, not, I wouldn't say suppressed, but not much is made of it. Uh, Volodymyr Burluk, on the other hand, uh, is an artist that is only associated with Ukraine, although he and his brother were very much a part of the whole development of Russian futurism. My point for saying this is that uh, we should not be scared <laughs> or offended by the fact that Ukrainian artists are co-opted by Russian art history. Uh, and we know that uh, it's been a long time that this has been happening. However, again, as I say, this watershed moment of Ukraine, of Russia's war against Ukraine, uh, might give us an opportunity to really demonstrate that so much of Russian culture uh, has been dependent on uh, the novelty, as I think they would perceive it, the novelty and the fascination and imagination and creativity of uh, Ukrainian artists. Uh, I think uh, this goes hand in hand with the discovery that uh, Ukrainians are fighters. Nobody could believe that uh, Ukrainians had uh, the, the, uh, the gumption to fight off a big, a big, and I say big in terms of numbers, um, a big army like Russia's. But I think the same can be said about art, that there is a lot to be said about 
uh, the real flavor of Ukraine that enters into what has complacently been accepted as uh, Russian art. So I had mentioned um, uh, the books in English, uh, since I'm thinking about uh, the future and going forward in uh, training the next generation of art historians who might uh, need exposure to the art, uh, the modern art of uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Uh, titles such as this, uh, uh, Camilla Gray's The Russian Experiment in Art, which originally was the great experiment in art, but since the 70s, uh, the title has been changed. On this cover, it have, we have the image of Vladimir Takin, uh, who again uh, was a very central figure of, of Russian modernism, but who hails from Kharkiv, and who uh, should be remembered as also bringing something of the uh, industrial environ of his birthplace uh, to the constructivist ethos and the constructivist aesthetic of several decades hence. Uh, and here I'm showing you another aspect of, of Kathleen, and that is uh, his playing the bandura, uh, which uh, is, very, is not very well known. Uh, he actually used uh, bandura playing to join a capella that went to Berlin that allowed him to go to, uh, to, to the West and then go to Picasso's studio where he began to uh, orient himself in Picasso's latest uh, work, which was building reliefs and constructions. And this is a kind of a departure point uh, for Tatlin as well. Um, but I want to just a side note, uh, in a monograph on Tatin uh, written by uh, John Milner, a British uh, art historian, they have this photograph, but the caption is Tatin playing the Domra. Uh, so you see that uh, the Russian instrument was suddenly uh, introduced into, into the picture. However, um, Tatlin uh, needs, in a sense, to be contextualized uh, within a Ukrainian kind of modernist aura because uh, he was uh, very much uh, close to uh, the, uh, the avant-garde uh, literary figures uh, in Kharkiv, especially around 1927 when he came to the uh, Kiev Art Institute to teach. Uh, and uh, here is a cover of his design for uh, a collection of poems by Bajan, by the futurist Semenko, by Shkurupi, uh, and it's very much in this industrial aesthetic, which we call constructivist, but this has nothing to do with Russia. And I think it's a, a work of art that helps us to um, start this discussion about Ukrainian, the Ukrainian context uh, in um, what is still referred to as Russian art. Um, this is really just a little detail of sites uh, within Ukraine uh, that identify these artists uh, with Ukraine physically, places where we know that they have lived or places with which we know that they were affiliated. But I want to uh, think about other things in terms of uh, art historical methodologies or stylistic studies or um, influences, which is a, a, an important factor in any uh, art historical research. Coming back to Tatlin playing the bandura, I think there's an essay uh, in the future uh, that might actually explore uh, Tatlin's interest in uh, the, um, the kind of imagery that you see, oops, sorry, uh, imagery that you see here in which he uses space, he uses um, the interstices between material uh, and uh, curvature as well, uh, which is really uh, kind of incumbent on the design of the bandura, uh, which translates or can be seen as translating in part onto uh, two major projects that we associate Tatlin with. Uh, the one on the right is the famous monument to the Third International, never actually built. We only know it from models, but here it's in, in superimposed on uh, the St. Petersburg, um, uh, the Petrograd, Petrograd landscape where it was intended to, um, uh, to signify 
world revolution. Uh, and at the same time, in the 30s, Tatlin started building his own uh, plane, uh, which he called Le Tatlin, where we have the same kind of stylistic material combination uh, that uh, we associate with the aesthetic of constructivism, which I think uh, can be very uh, inventively traced back to his the material interest in the metal and the wood of the construction of a bandura. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, exposure of Ukrainian artists in the West, uh, but of course, uh, all the credit going to the USSR, as was the case with the famous Paris Exposition of Industrial and Decorative Arts in 1925. Uh, this was quite an event for the USSR because um, Paris thought that it was going to be on the front line uh, of showing a French culture. Um, a German uh, was rebuffed uh, or felt rebuffed because it got an uh, invitation too late, uh, but the Soviet Union was ready to join because it was going to show off the best of the best uh, uh, of its uh, artistic products by 1925. Uh, the Paris Exposition was really focused on the theater uh, arts. Uh, or primarily it brought into focus modern theater stagecraft. Um, and at this exposition in a very fanciful pavilion uh, built by um, Konstantin Melnikov, uh, we had designs by uh, some of the members of the Berezil, Kurbas's Berezil group, uh, and, uh, and Vadim Meller, the uh, Ukrainian constructivist, um, um, designer from Kharkiv, of course, uh, came under uh, great attention because of his uh, uh, truly progressive and cutting edge designs for uh, Kurbas's productions. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, a, a documentary photograph of Meller standing with the maquette to the uh, Secretary of the Union, uh, for which he won uh, a medal at the Paris 1925 exposition. But of course, he did not get credit as a Ukrainian, the USSR got the credit. And of course, uh, conflating USSR, Soviet Union with Russia, Russia got the credit for Meyer's design. Here's just a, a close up of, or just a single photograph of the same. Uh, the uh, Americans who had gone to the exhibit in Paris were so amazed by the advanced nature of, of, of the stage of theater in, um, in the republics of the Soviet Union that they almost wholesale brought uh, many of the uh, exposition items to New York uh, and had a grand exhibition in New York. Uh, with a review uh, in uh, which essentially uh, functioned as a catalog for the exhibition. In that um, uh, catalog, let's call it, Meller and Berezil were featured under the name of Russia. Uh, their names misspelled, no credit given to Ukraine. Uh, and so it goes, this gets filed in Lincoln Center Theater a library and anybody interested in uh, art stagecraft of the 1920s uh, from the former USSR uh, would think that Meller and Kurbas and the whole lot of Ukrainians were really all from Russia. Uh, here's just another really bad reproduction from that catalog uh, from uh, the Berezil Theater production designed by Meller, but you can see here Theater Berezil Kiev, Russia. So I'm going to make a switch here because I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but we are, are so fortunate, again, another watershed moment, so fortunate uh, that uh, Russia uh, is not represented at this year's uh, Venice Biennale, but Ukraine is. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you can read about the, the, uh, the hellish, um, uh, travel of the artists to participate in this year's Venice Biennale, which just opened a week or two ago. Uh, and I think we could take great pride and use this as a wonderful launch pad to begin to focus on, on Ukraine uh, in a kind of a cultural 
from a cultural vantage point. Uh, the featured artist at the Venice Biennale uh, this year is uh, Pablo Mako from Kharkiv, uh, just a wonderful graphic artist who, uh, whose work uh, is always has a, a political edge to it. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the work uh, because you can read about it. I just simply want to expose um, the audience to the fact that Ukraine is big at the Venice Biennale this year. Uh, and I think we can do a lot with uh, how it is represented uh, and take pride as well uh, in, uh, in it being in its being featured. And I think this is a moment of education as well where, uh, so many visitors over the months that the Biennale takes place will see Ukraine represented and, and the curiosity that they have about Ukraine stimulated by the war uh, is bound to work in our favor, in our favor if we get to work ourselves. Uh, and I'm trying to follow up on some of the comments uh, that Virko made. Uh, some close-ups. I just wanted to contrast uh, Mako's work uh, with uh, the previous Biennale exposition, uh, which took place in 2019, it was skipped because of COVID. Um, this was um, another representation of Ukraine, which was, I would say, uh, well, it was described as weird, but it was a little bit pathetic too, I think. It was called The Shadow of a Dream, cast upon Giardini della, uh, della Biennale. And it had to do with it was like 15 minutes by which um, uh, here's a description of what the Ukrainian contribution was to be. It was supposed to have uh, the great uh, Maria uh, cargo plane fly over the Giardini Gardens and everybody was supposed to look up for 15 minutes. That was the performance piece. Uh, and that was going to be Ukraine's presence uh, at the Venice Biennale. Um, and uh, instead, uh, well, in addition to the uh, the pavilion, uh, sorry, the pavilion that housed the Ukrainian representation, only showed, as you see here on the left, uh, a photograph of the interior of the Antonov plane, uh, and as you see on the right, that white. Uh, sign, it had listed over 1,143 artists' names and art groups. That was Ukraine's representation. And on the right, you have uh, uh, the names of the artists that were contained in the little booklet uh, that was passed around or that you could pick up if you visited this particular site. Um, I say that that representation was pathetic uh, because um, it was in a little room. Uh, there was a little cafe table where you could sit and look into uh, this photograph of the interior of the uh, Maria plane. There was no discussion. Uh, there was no, it, it just had, had, had no context. Uh, uh, it was pretty pathetic. And I think uh, the plane didn't actually fly over. Uh, and that was another great disappointment. But the bigger disappointment is that the Maria plane uh, was of course destroyed on February 27th uh, uh, at, at the outset of the war. Uh, just a few final comments regarding Ukraine, Ukrainians in the West. Uh, Ukrainians took away a, a great uh, aplomb at the Venice Biennales of 1928, 1930 especially. Here you have a good number of them represented. Uh, and most of them were representatives of the avant-garde, Bohomazo, for example, Petritsky, um, Viktor Palmov, great names uh, in the catalog of the, of the Venice Biennale of 1930. Uh, but interesting as well is this, these artists were, many of them representatives of the Boychukist school, uh, which in 1937, many of the artists of the Boychukist school were executed. So uh, another point to be made. Uh, this painting, uh, which they call Disabled, it's called Invalide by Anatoly Petritsky, which had shown uh, in the Venice Biennale of 1930, won an award and, a great, and great write-ups in the local newspapers. And today it hangs in the National Art Museum of Ukraine. Um, I think this subject of Ukraine's participation in the Biennales, although it has been the subject of a book, but I think it can be made more of during the season of the Biennale in Venice uh, today. 
So I'll end with uh, Pablo Marco's Fountain of Exhaustion uh, in Venice today uh, and pass it on to the next speaker so that we can have a conversation uh, thereafter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Mudrak. Um, let me um, pass things over to Adriana Helbig, uh, who is an ethnomusicologist, professor of music, and chair of the Department of Music at the University of Pittsburgh. And she is the author of the books Hip Hop Ukraine, Music, Race, and African Migration, and Resounding Poverty, Romani Music and Development Aid, um, which you'll be able to see soon uh, from Oxford University Press. Um, she's also received scholarships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, American Councils for International Education, IREX, and Fulbright. Um, and now today uh, she is the treasurer and a member of the board of uh, the Society of Ethnomusicology um, and also is the treasurer um, and a member of the board of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Um, so thank you very much for being with us and um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Markian. And I, I just want to take uh, this opportunity to thank you uh, for really putting on uh, exemplary programming uh, during this process. I mean, Shevchenko Scientific Society has, I don't think in the past, been at such a foregrounded uh, peak um, of, of, of identity in itself, coming together as an as a intellectual uh, community. And I just really appreciate the Zoom lectures um, and the abilities of everybody to come together, Miroslava Mudrak and of course, uh, Victor Belay, who has also informed me that he has numerous other projects the minute we get off this Zoom. So um, the Anton Varga I haven't met in person, but I look forward to um, hearing what he has to say as well. So just taking a brief look at who is actually in the Zoom room. First, I want to thank everybody uh, for uh, really investing in younger scholars. Um, this is uh, where I count myself as very lucky. I uh, entered the ethnomusicology program at Columbia University in the late 1990s. Um, at that time, when I received a scholarship of seven years, I was told by my uh, professors that I could not write a dissertation on Ukraine, that they would not sponsor a dissertation in Ukraine. Not only would I get a, not get a job if I wrote, uh, such a dissertation, but also that inherently they simply assumed that whatever research I would produce would be um, anti-Semitic and nationalist in nature. Um, here I actually want to acknowledge uh, a older colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Daria Nebish, who wrote a dissertation at the University of Maryland just a few years before I entered an ethnomusicology program, and she wrote on Hutsule. Um, and this to date is, for a very long time actually, was the, the only dissertation on a Ukrainian theme. Um, as uh, uh, Markian has shared, I write about Roma, about gypsies, and I've written about African um, musicians in Ukraine. Part of the reason for that is because I would not have been able to get a job. I would not have been able to publish. And those two books actually were published through really tremendous difficulty uh, through reviewers. So the first, the Hip Hop Ukraine, I'll share that I had two reviewers. The first was anonymous. There were no issues. The second uh, was clearly a Russian um, music specialist who spent 10 pages of four pages of the 10 page review uh, speaking about the fact that I mentioned the whole of the mar. And when I went back to the manuscript, I actually mentioned the whole of the mar twice. Um, and this is in the Kharkiv region where most of the African musicians uh, that I was researching with um, lived and their association with the Kharkiv region and also with the whole of the mar, the narrative of the whole of the mar uh, has to do with their uh, experiences in their respective countries in Uganda, um, whether you're thinking of a colonial uh, structure or uh, engagements with famine. These were uh, stories that were very, very close to the hearts of the African musicians that I was writing about. The second issue, which I'm still battling with, uh, has to do with a, a reviewer of my second manuscript. And the second manuscript is based on my longtime research among Roma in Zakarpatia. 
And as you know, uh, those regions are Hungarian in history. And the second reviewer was clearly Hungarian. And the 20 page critique of the manuscript started with, and then on sentence one of paragraph one, uh, Helbig clearly does not speak Hungarian and is clearly putting forward a Ukrainian fascist view. And as a young scholar, those types of words scared me being associated uh, or, or labeled anti-Semitic or, or those kinds of narratives that perhaps I didn't know or have the tools to respond to. At this point, I simply call the press and I say, this is the story. And as you can see, I'm not even going to respond to any of these critiques. Thank you for publishing. That position uh, and why I actually have now focused not to be a performer or, you know, to, to even go into teaching as much as I used to, but go into administration is precisely because of that type of narrative that still exists behind the scenes. So whether we're talking about hiring tenured track professors, bringing in graduate students, um, choosing course uh, topics, these are all decided behind the scenes. And no matter what we say, in these types of Zoom meetings, there will always be one person higher up who can then push and deny and move this forward. At the University of Pittsburgh, I almost feel guilty that at some point I asked the Ukrainian community to submit uh, funds for the saving of the Ukrainian language program. Uh, this was uh, about 10 years ago uh, at a time when Kat uh, Katria Dobenko was still teaching the Ukrainian language um, and she was retiring. And we were informed very late in the game uh, that uh, we would need to come up with two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars to replace Katria Dobenko. Now, it was not clear to anybody at the time that Katria Dobenko was actually not receiving any salary to teach the Ukrainian language at the University of Pittsburgh. She was volunteering. So here we're asked to cough up $250,000. We had a, a six, in six weeks, we actually uh, brought together $60,000, which actually allowed us to continue the uh, courses. Now, as a department chair, I realized that all you have to actually do is ask the university to allow certain courses to be taught and it's part of the ancillary budget and money is freely given for any kind of course that the chair decides. So the chair at the time, David Bierenbaum, he is still at Pitt. We have very cold relationships. Uh, at this point, uh, we are equals, uh, but for 15 years, I was not. And so these kinds of narratives and, and the power plays uh, have, are, are still very much at play. Uh, today, there is a Ukrainian film um, uh, a festival happening at, at the University of Pittsburgh. It's sponsored by the Slavic department. It's been going on for more than 25 years. This is the first year that it's dedicated to Ukrainian film and the media in Pittsburgh is presenting this as an unusual situation. And, and, and you know, we are now welcome and we're being interested, you know, we're interested in the Ukrainian film uh, offerings and how for the foresight the foresight of the professors that have put this together. The two people that have put this together, Nancy Kandi and Vladimir Padunov, uh, long-term uh, professors uh, in Slavic, have a portrait of Stalin in their home. And at the end of this film festival, everyone will go to their home for a party. So I ask you, at what point and do we actually need to engage with the structures as they are right now? The way that this uh, conversation is set up, what are the problems? What are the problems from the Ukrainian side and how should we mold ourselves to engage with broader narratives? But the broader narrative is the problem. The broader narrative within academia, and I, I will just piggyback on, on uh, Professor Ballet, um, in, in saying that politicians and academics actually do have quite a bit in common. And academics right now are working behind the scenes every single day. We're working with the media. Uh, we're, we're asked to give commentary. Um, 
and they are citing and reading the books that, uh, that we are writing. Um, the most important thing, though, is to recognize that when a media personality contacts a university, they are contacting the chair, right? So they are contacting Birmaum. Um, um, Nancy Condi um, has numerously now been cited um, and saying, well, you know, Ukrainians and Russians have always been friendly together. We don't know where this is coming from. You then call that media outlet and you tell them the story. Most journalists are young. They don't remember much of the experiences from 30 years ago. And that's also the first question that I ask when I speak to a journalist. And actually you can hear by the voice, how old are you? What do you actually know? And up in, you know, the 20 uh, interviews that I've had so far, only there was one problem um, and the journalist was my age, he was 47 years old and had been a representative to the uh, Moscow Times and wanting to impose his own narrative onto what is Ukraine. And at that point, uh, I simply called above him and said that I will not work with this journalist until he's able to really understand and until he steps foot in Ukraine. So the power dynamics um, that are at play um, when we're, I'll speak a little bit about music because this, this is uh, a, every single event in Ukraine foregrounds music. And uh, with respect to all the other arts, there's something about music that captures the imagination, not only of the people that are fighting, um, at the time, whether they're protesting or they're in the fields. And again, we have Radio Bayraktar right now uh, that is uh, immediately started to work uh, you know, at the four at the um, front lines, and um, you know, music from the Ukrainian diaspora, and also from new music that's being generated in response to this uh, to this terrible war that we're in. Um, there's a, a, a sonic response. Um, so when we're looking at the structures of music departments in general, um, one of the things to recognize, and this, again, this Virko had also mentioned this. Uh, uh, prominence of Russian music. Um, this actually goes back to the 19th century. Uh, in the 19th century, when we're looking at the history of, of music uh, as an entity, as a, um, as a profession, um, music criticism, uh, music scholarship, this is coming out of the Germanic lands. Um, and this is foregrounding and highlighting German uh, composers, right? So we're, whether we're looking at uh, Beethoven or Mozart or Bach, it's not unusual that everybody would know these names. It's less usual to know um, even some of the Russian names because the Russians don't actually come into music history narratives until after World War II. That happens because music departments in the United States are mirrored on the structures of music departments in Europe. This happens about 120 years ago, turn of the century. The practice of the Germanic um, musical, classical music traditions then upped the uh, representation of um, elites in, in the United States. After World War II, when we have uh, people moving in um, from Eastern Europe, especially uh, into music departments in the West, um, there, there a growth of interest in not only Russian music or what is codified as Russian music. And again, the same situation happens as what um, Professor Mudrak uh, represented in our history. But also we have the establishment of the Society for Ethnomusicology. And this is this grappling situation that we are still in. And I just put a link uh, into the Zoom chat, uh, www.ethnomusicology.org backslash Ukraine. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Maria Sonovitsky from BARD, and to acknowledge uh, the heavy work of Irina Voloshina, who's a graduate student at Indiana University, uh, Melissa Bielecki at uh, University of Illinois, and Marsha Ostroshevsky uh, from Canada for helping pull together resources that we knew would be immediately needed for the media the minute the uh, war broke out. And this, this, this uh, website actually began that night when the first bombs fell because we knew that we would need to respond. Now that website carries both classical music, folk music, popular music, all types of music that are associated with Ukraine. And this is the problem um, with Ukrainian narratives in the music fields. Um, 
Ukraine, the way that the uh, histories are set up, you have the Western European scholarship that is associated as um, historical musicology, and then everything else becomes ethnomusicology. And so Ukraine is functioning in this ethnomusicology narrative as a folk narrative. Now, as we move with this narrative, and again, this narrative is breaking just a little bit um, in the last 10 years, um, as people are picking up on narratives of decolonialization and are really moving away from offering um, classes in music departments that focus solely on Western art music. Um, but this narrative of decolonialization, of, of creating a, a connection across boundaries and encouraging students to really recognize that looking at musical entities within nation, um, national boundaries, it does not really make sense anymore in the cyberspace. So here music travels a little bit differently and very quickly. So again, as we've been seeing, if you've been watching TikTok, if you've been watching Facebook, if anybody is interested and hasn't followed this, if you can log into Facebook and follow me, Adriana Helbig, you can see I post daily um, musical recordings that, that come out of the field. Um, there's been a narrative of how this has been developing um, and, and connecting across the world. And it's, it's not unusual that now that people are able to hear music from Ukraine, whether the Oyuluzi uh, Chorvana Kalina example that people are singing all over the world, um, or of course the Ukrainian anthem. So this circulation of music through the Cyprus space is offering a new way, a new way of engaging um, with a Ukraine. What is this Ukraine that's actually coming up? What are we actually experiencing? Because today we have the Eurovision finals. I just checked in, we don't know the, 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 the results yet, but Kalush Orchestra is, is positioned to win, whether it's a sympathy vote or whether it's because they're a, a, an, an incredible group, which is my vote, that would be because they are an incredible uh, group and the, and the example Stefania is, is a wonderful piece. Um, how do we, uh, so if Ukraine wins, then Eurovision then returns uh, and Ukraine then hosts. And this was actually that first time when Ukraine won in 2004 and hosted in 2005. It opened the global music industries to bring um, Ukrainian music out into the West. At this point, what's going to happen is the global world will come um, into Ukraine and engage it in a different way. So, you know, as we move forward, this is all I just simply wanted to say. I wanted to bring your attention to the history of the structures of music uh, departments, the role of administrators, the importance of that, and the very significant role of the cyber spheres um, and how watching the development of the Ukrainian music industries um, as we move out of this war into reconstruction. So thank you. Uh, thanks uh, so much, uh, Dr. Herdig. Um, this this really um, you know makes us all think about the uh, institutions and structures, right? The, over the long term, now they develop. That is really one of the crucial things that uh, sort of determines how things are are perceived, how things are received, right? How art and culture and and scholarship are are perceived and valued, and how value is assigned to those things. So, thank you so much for. Um, drawing our attention to that. And um, now I'd like to turn the floor over to our fourth presenter. Um, Anton Varga is an artist, designer, and curator. Um, he graduated from the Transcarpathian Institute of Arts and studied at the Kharkiv Academy of Design and Arts, the Poznan Academy of Arts, as well as Hunter College in New York City. Um, he has exhibited individual and group art projects in Ukraine, Italy, Poland, Hungary, and the USA. And he has been at, uh, in art residencies in Poland, the Czech Republic, and the Netherlands. And as a member of Open Group, um, he has curated a Ukrainian pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, so um, I'm very pleased uh, that Anton has uh, joined us. He's also a member of Entisha and uh, a corresponding member of, in the, potentially in the arts and music section. And um, he, 
will talk a, a little bit about his experiences of the visual arts. So, Anton, please. Yes, thank you, Lycan. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Meet you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining, like our uh, public, to uh, join us today. Yeah, I will tell about the, um, about the Venice Biennial representation of Ukraine. I think uh, Venice Biennial at this point is the most famous and the big platform of representing visual art uh, like at the international scene. And I will try like in those like 20 years that Ukraine has this experience, I will try to go through and will I will try to show some progress and developments that Ukraine did during those years. So now I will share my screen and okay. 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 Do Looks you good. See? We can see it. Yeah. You can see the screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, first of all, just uh, a quick note is I don't know if everybody went, uh, if everybody knows what Giardini della Biennale is, but um, the the Venice itself, the the uh, the biennial at Venice has like um, uh, usually like 150 different pavilions, but only like only 35 are located in the main like in the old part of Venice, like uh, the Giardini Gardens, where which were originally built to to have those pavilions of of countries. At that point, it was like the end of 18th century, the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century. And uh, the Russian Empire Pavilion was actually founded by Ukrainian uh, magnate Khamenko. It was built in 1811. And since then, it was a, a pavilion of Russian Empire, and then it became a pavilion of Soviet Union, of course. After the 90s, it became the pavilion of Russia, obviously. So, for example, like Czechoslovakia also had uh, their pavilion there, but the Czechia, like Czech Republic and Slovakia are using pavilion kind of like uh, each, each by each one, like every, every two years. So, but that's not the case with Russia, of course. So Ukraine has always have to uh, find a place uh, outside, uh, outside the Jardinis, uh, outside the gardens in the city, rent some uh, rent some villa or something all rent some pavilions in arsenal arsenal it's like a it's a it's also like a it's a second part of the venice biennial itself uh huge uh like where the where the uh, where the ships used to be built at venice now it's like a huge territory of the pavilions so yeah let's let's just move further so first one, uh, Ukraine was represented in 2001. That was the first time Ukraine was represented at Venice Biennial, at 49th Venice Biennial. With the project, the, it was also called the first Ukrainian project, Polatka or Tent. And uh, it, it's kind of also started from the scandal. Uh, that's, that's how everything that's why it's also very important, like to understand. Maybe I will tell some things from the from the inside, right? For the things that usual uh, uh, usual like viewer will will not even mention or notice. But it's also very important, like how this all culture around Venice Biennial in Ukraine, in Ukrainian scene, how it was like shaping. So, for example, uh, the first. The first pavilion was all, already scandalous because uh, the minister Bogdan Stupko, the minister of culture at that point, uh, he appointed uh, he appointed uh, uh, Yuri Onu uh, to be a commissioner and Ivan Karas to be appoint was appointed to be curator of the Ukrainian pavilion, and they chose uh, Mazak Foundation Igor Podolchak and Igor Durich to represent uh, to represent Ukraine with the project the best artist of the 20th century. Uh, the idea of their project was that to show uh, brands and products made uh, made by the most famous and best artists of the of the 20th century, like Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, 
Paul Pot, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, the, the, like famous scientists like Sigmund Freud, uh, terrorists, uh, war criminals. That was like pretty bold project, let's say very conceptual. But uh, the um, particular, the, the Kiev scene, the representatives of Kiev scene at that point, like uh, Arsene Savadov uh, and, and his friends, they were not satisfied, but by the by this appointment of uh, of Mazo Foundation and um, they kind of they protested and after the scandalous intervention of the deputy prime minister of Ukraine Mykola Zelensky the project was rejected the the original one and the curator of the project was dismissed so instead a new curator Valentin Rayevsky was appointed the first Ukrainian project tent was selected so yeah so the first one was already scandalous. And you can see that uh, the Arsene Savado, Valentin Rayevsky, Olaf Tistol, Yuri Selemko were the participants of this Palatka project. Uh, I would like you to remember this name, Arsene Savado, maybe somebody of you knows it, but we will, we will come back to him later. So uh, this is the 50s when it's biennial, 2003. Uh, it was Viktor Sidorenko's The Mill of Time, uh, The Mill of Time project. The creators were Solovyov and Fedoruk. Uh, the commissioners was also Ministry of Culture. Uh, uh, what, what, what was important that this time, uh, this time the representative of Ukraine was just uh, was just selected also basically by the by the artist union and Victor Sidorico is well known uh, uh, well known ac academical painter he tried to do some uh, like uh, and at, at the Venice Biennial he tried to uh, kind of do something new for him so it was a video work for like uh, 15 minutes and like two pieces of canvases uh, was pretty abstract uh, yeah, I will. I will not try to go deep into each work because that that will take a lot of time. I think like the, the mechanism, how the how the commissioners, how the creators, how the participants were appointed is much more interesting in this in this uh, in this regards. And also, it shows it shows this internal power dynamics, battle struggle inside the Ukrainian scene, and also in the end, as a result, what the what the international viewer was was able to see. So uh, 50, 51st Venice Biennial, uh, Mikola Babak, Your Children Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I like this. Uh, so Mikola Babak just showed uh, Motonki, like uh, Lalki Motonki. And next to the this like photos of children from the 18th and uh, 19th century, uh, uh, his his famous uh, his famous quotation about the project was "Don't shout, don't shout about the whole world. Tell about your village, but so that the whole world will hear." It's a Milish form of actual quotation, but uh, so. Uh, commissioner was uh, Alexei Titrenko. Uh, commissioner was Viktor Hamatov, and curator was Alexei Titrenko, a quite known uh, gallerist at that point in Kiev. So, uh, why Mikola Babak was chosen, nobody knows. I mean, it's it's even really hard for now to understand those really un not transparent uh, pro like processes that was were going on. In, in the backstage of this, like choosing the creators, choosing the repre representatives. Uh, I guess it was some lobby of the, of the creator of the Alexei Titorenko. Anyway, let's go further. So uh, uh, what's important about uh, 51st Venice Biennial? First time uh, Pinchuk, Victor Pinchuk showed his collect collection at Venice Biennial. He showed it under the name of first acquisitions of Ukrainian artists Savado, Mikhailov, Tsagolov, and also foreign artists like Filippo Pereno, Navin Ravanshi Kul, John Naiguen Nahatsushibi, John Gwen Hansushibi, Karsen Hilary, also Hilary. So uh, this, this is also very important because this is the first time 
as uh, Pinchuk, uh, uh, Victor Pinchuk with his foundation appeared at Venice Biennial. And the next Venice Biennial, 53rd in 2009, uh, Pinch, uh, Victor Pinchuk and his just, uh, uh, just founded Pinchuk Arts became already a great creators and commissioners of the Ukrainian pavilion. So we can already see this like switch from the uh, Minister of Culture being a commissioner of the pavilion and now it's a Pinchukar Center with the, with the creator, with the president of Pinchukar Center, Peter Doroshenko being uh, also like a commissioner and Vladimir Klitschko being a creator of the pavilion. Can you imagine? Uh, Vladimir Klitschko being a creator of the uh, pavilion at uh, Venice Biennale. Anyway, I mean, I, I guess that's Ukraine in 2009, right? Uh, yeah, and Ilya Chishkan and Mih uh, Mihara Yasuhiro, the Japanese artists, they also, they represent the, they did this project, Dreamers Steps. It's, um, here you can see the, here you can see the installation. It's like one of the villa in Venice, uh, kind of basically just full of sand and with like some small media works on the, on the walls. Uh, use it like, the, the citation of Vladimir Klitschko, using various visual elements, Ilya Chishkan and Mihara Yasuhiro create for the viewer of the exhibition an opportunity to understand the tr transitional nature of perception, focusing on the process of awareness. Vladimir Klitschko. Okay, and let's move to the next one. Uh, 54th Venice Biennial, 2011. Oksana Mais, Post with Photo Renaissance. Uh, this time, uh, Victor Sidorenko, the, the, the artist who was a representative in uh, like four years ago, now he becomes a commissioner because now he's also a director of the Institute of Contemporary Art of the National Academy of Arts of Ukraine. At that point, it was also new, but like new founded institution in, inside the Academy of Arts of Ukraine. So he became a commissioner. Uh, uh, the Oleksiy Gochenko and Achille, Achille Bonito Oliva, the creators of the pavilion. What Oksana Mais did? So you can see this uh, this kind of mosaics from uh, Pesanke. Yeah, it's a, it's a mosaics from X and uh, from Ukrainian Pesanke. Um, uh, it was a kind of uh, Kind of weird, in a way interesting, but also uh, was uh, was widely criticized project because uh, by, uh, there was uh, the the frescas, the mosaics themselves are just uh, trying to represent the frescas of one egg, and uh, and there was like those uh, very loud. Um, very loud uh, words about uh, from Oksana Mas that she used 10,000 eggs painted by 50 different people of different nationalities and religion. And so it was like so much about like, about the scale, about this like amazing scale, about this compli like complicated project. But in the end, it was just uh, it was this like mosaics of the of the X on uh, on on one of the piazza in uh, in Venice. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, again, I I, I don't want to go inside really deep into the, like criticizing the projects. Fifty uh, fifth Venice Biennial at in two thousand thirteen. Um, again, Commissioner Victor Sidorenko. Uh, but the and minister of culture kind of is back to be a uh, to, to be a, like a main commissioner of the Venice Pavilion. So uh, Alexander Solyov and Viktor Burlaka, they're correct, they creators of the pavilion. They're pretty known uh, creators in Kiev, from Kiev, and uh, and they decided to show three young artists, which is was kind of a new also. Uh, break point like to show young or like to show uh, emerging artists at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the pavilion in Venice. So Hamlet Zinkowski, Mikola Ridney and Jana Kadyrova, they 
together they created this project of monuments to, to the monument. Uh, you can see, uh, so the first picture is Hamid Zinkiewski uh, graphics and installation of his like, mm, from his like uh, graphics diary. Uh, let, and uh, the second picture is Mikolas Ridney monuments. Mikolas Ridney uh, originally from Kharkiv and he is in his practice, he usually works on this like Soviet and post-Soviet heritage also experimenting with these different types of like possible modernistic monuments that could be possibly erected or could be like, uh, could, could exist in, in general in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, on the right, uh, on the right, uh, on the right image, you can see uh, Jana Skadirva work monument to the monument, actually, that's where, where from, uh, where from the name of the main, of the general project came from. So yeah, you see the sculpture of kind of just uh, the, the monument that has just to be opened, has to be just revealed to the public. Uh, let's move further. The 56th Venice Biennial. Uh, I would say uh, what's, what's important to, to say about all these years, because I mentioned about uh, Pinchuk back in 2005, when he first showed his collection. And since then, Pinchuk was always present at Venice Biennial with, uh, with his collateral event, Future Generation Art Prize. So uh, Future Generation Art Prize is a, is a very famous uh, competition concourse uh, at the uh, Pinchuk Art Center is uh, doing every two years, and basically, it's it's like it's it's a competition for artists from all over the world. With a actually with a quite significant uh, money rewards. Uh, so you so the why I mentioned this because uh, the the people who are taking part in this future generation prize in Kyiv, they, uh, they also have show in Venice at this collateral event that Pichuk is also doing. So it's like future generation art prize. So all these years, uh, parallel to the Ukrainian pavilion, Pichuk also was doing this future generation art prizes shows. So he was also, always present in, uh, uh, at Venice. But in 2015, after the, after the occupation of Donbass of Crimea, right, after, this, after the start of the war, Minister of Culture told, openly stated that there is no money for pavilion of Ukraine at Venice Biennial. So it's like, Everything goes to the front, right? To buy armor, uh, to buy arms. And uh, Pinchuk himself and his foundation, Pinchuk and Senf, they announced that they they will be glad to take all the all the expenses, all the costs of the Ukrainian National Pavilion uh, at in this year in 2015. So. And th this is also what, what, what's very important. Uh, they built the new pavilion, basically. Uh, it, it, it wasn't permanent. Yes, it, it was built only for three, three months, even though the, the, usually, the, the, uh, usually the biennial uh, lasts for six months. But still, Pinchuk built this glass pavilion right on the way to Giardini Biennale from Arsenale which was like, had a huge traffic of people. And of course the commissioner of the National Pavilion was still Minister of Culture, but slash Pinchuk Art Center. And the creator of the project became the uh, creative director of Pinchuk Art Center, Bjorn Geltkov. So in this, in this glass pavilion, Pinchuk showed, uh, not Pinchuk, Bjorn Geltkov as creator, he showed uh, six Ukraine, like five Ukrainian uh, artists and one collective open group. And I myself was a part, uh, still a part of open group. So I also was taking part 
uh, in this pavilion. Uh, yeah, here, here's the here's some footage from the from this uh, from the pavilion itself. On the left, you can see Robota. Uh, you can see the work of Nikita Kadan from different artifacts from the front. You see like Lisa Chan's, um, Lisa Chan's sign damaged by the uh, by the explosions or, or something. You can see some other artifacts from the front at that point. You know, at, at that point, the, the war, everything was pretty something new for Ukraine and also for, for Europe. So it was, it had a huge success, I think also, the pavilion itself, this glass cube, was also very impressive. On the right, you can see the, the work of Open Group, uh, where uh, where the participants of Open Group, uh, each after another, for three months, we were waiting on the online streaming for the Ukrainian soldiers to come back home. We were basically uh, waiting for this moment for them, like coming to their doors to their like yeah to their patios to their doors from the front but it's again it's it takes a lot of time to to go deep in all those like conceptions and even to describe all the works let's just go far okay, i would like I'm sorry yes. to interrupt anton um we are running out of time on the oh. panel so i wanted to just see if you could wrap up and then we can you can continue on and make more observations in the question and answers portion uh, so how, how much time do I still have? Uh, if you could wrap up in two minutes, that would be great. Two minutes. Okay. I mean, uh, so I will, I will then, I will say because uh, Pani Mudrak said something, uh, said uh, things about the pavilion I was uh, creating. So um, it was the sh Shadow of Dreamcast upon Giardini della Biennale. Uh, uh, Larissa uh, uh, Mudrak said that there was nothing in the pavilion, only some pictures. No, it was like a two-channel projection. First of all, here you can see, here you can see on the on the screenings. Also, there were like five performer performers retelling the story of the flight itself during all the pavilion. So it there was a a lot of uh, it's not there was performance happening in the pavilion every day for three months so and uh, there was a projection of the of the flight and why the flight is not happened that's why it was my old presentation about because uh, because exactly of this internal struggle and dynamics uh, about this fetishizing of the venice pavilion of the venice participation uh so, for example, our project was just sabotaged by Arsene Sovado, who was a participant of the first pavilion in 2001. On the, on the, on the picture, you can, say, you can see the paid protest. Can you imagine the paid protest by one artist to do like to protest against the projects of another artist? It's Ukraine in, 2000, in, in 2018. So you can, you can see this like pensioners and students holding, holding these signs about Venice and uh, you know probably not many of them really went to Venice or even know what Venice Biennial is but Arsene Sabado paid this protest our project was sabotaged uh, 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 just simply to say it's very it's very simple just to say that flies didn't happen because our all curatorial team was working on on that that flight supposed to happen it didn't happen because Ukrobron Prom and also and also Antonov plant itself just uh, di disregarded uh, disregarded basically Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Transportation. They decided to sabotage the project. They declined. Uh, they declined the uh, the price negotiations for this flight because they just asked commercial price for the flight to happen, which, at, which was at that point 250,000 euros. Can you imagine for the one flight, which was the whole budget of the pavilion? So, and they declined all the negotiation process or like to, to, to make it like uh, cheaper or also like a campaign thing for Ukraine at this point. So of course the flight didn't happen. 
And uh, I also wanted just to show, yeah, that's what happened to Maria, but uh, uh, Pani Mudrak already showed this. So this, the, the story with the plane is still already there. It's still, it didn't finish, you know, especially if, if Zelensky said that he wants to rebuild the plane. Anyway, uh, what's important about Pinchuk, because also in this year, except of national pavilion, there was also this huge pavilion of Ukraine made and organized by Pinchuk. So you can see like uh, the amount of people uh, uh, came to this villa in Venice. Zelensky had his speech there. Zelensky had speech at Pinchuk Pavilion, not at Ukrainian National Pavilion, which is which is also very interesting, right? And you can you can see the you can see the scale comparing to the Ukrainian Pavilion, and uh, you can see like the scale of this villa, which was rent by, uh, rented by rented by Pinchuk. So here, here's some footage, and also the participant, the part like Pinchuk invited to participate in his pavilion, like the worldly fame, like the internationally famous artists, like Marina Abramovich, Hearst, uh, uh, Murakami. You know, it's like it was a big thing. It's one of the things that uh, Pan uh, Virko Bele was saying. So when Pinchuk asked not Ukrainians tell about Ukraine, but when he paid to like worldly know and famous artists to do works about Ukraine, right? So now Damien Hirst has a work about Ukraine, you know? Now uh, uh, Marina Abramovich has a, has a piece about Ukraine. So th that was, I think that was important and big. And also there was a piazza, uh, th that's my last slideshow, um, I'm sorry. Also very important to mention that Venice Biennial itself as a as an organization, as a as an institution, they also propose to Ukraine has a Piazza Ukraina at Venice Biennial. And uh, the young designer, young architect Dana Kosmina, she built, she projected this Piazza Ukraina. And you can see like this columns, this burned down columns which are much more relevant, I think, to the, uh, to the contemporary, to the present situation in Ukraine. And you can, like, they even built this, uh, this sculpture, this like protected some monument, we don't know which one, but which also kind of talks to this, what's, what's happening right now in Ukraine and with the, yeah, in, in, with the culture in present situation. So this is Piazza Ukraina. Uh, yeah, I guess I will stop at this point. Yeah, sorry, I, I was ready to talk about the, the whole history but of the pavilion, but I think it's too much. Right? Yeah, there, there's a lot there. Thank you so much, uh, Anton, and um, for this overview. Um, I think it's really striking that, and I would like to open it up to questions directly to the audience. And while you're sending in your questions, I just would like to observe that um, the way that we talk about these things. Each of our speakers has has drawn attention to the kind of hidden structures that um, that influence reception of of uh, Ukrainian culture in the world, um, both uh, in academic circles and political circles, but also um, the kinds of structures that um, they, that determine important questions within Ukrainian art. So, as Anton mentioned, um, there are these questions about how decisions are made regarding the Ukrainian pavilion at the Venice Biennale and all of these things, you know, are sort of um, kind of related. So I, I, just as an observation. So um, the first question I would like to pose comes from uh, George Hrabovich. So the issue of anti-Ukrainian bias and stereotyping among fellow scholars in such fields as Slavic, i.e. largely Russian studies, but apparently also in music is all too familiar. And um, he says that this issue must now be met head on and thanks um, Adriana Helbig for bringing it up um, in her field. And now more than ever, this issue should be discussed forcefully and energetically by Anta Shah. And um, he looks forward to participating in such discussions. So uh, would anyone like to respond to, um, to uh, Professor Hrabovic? Let's see, Virko's hand is up. And feel free to unmute yourselves uh, to answer any of the questions. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the war opened our eyes in a way that a lot of us have not had the eyes open. For instance, the kind of experience that you all are talking about. 
And by the way, I have to at this point say, I'm so jealous of you visual artists. You can present a picture and talk over it. But we musicians cannot do that because presenting three minutes of a piece means nothing unless it is a three minute piece. So uh, it's uh, I, I just loved it, the whole presentation, but I, I did feel a certain handicap as a musician when the time is such an important factor. Uh, but most of you sort of have heard from me a lot about music anyway, so I think you're probably bored by now. I mean, I, I think Richie's comment is very true, but I'm, I am surprised, to be honest with you. I don't know about everybody else. For me, since I started doing this work, which was in 69, what you are talking about, I was facing all the time. We did a premiere of a piece of Sylvester, and this was in 1973. But that time, the festival that I had in Vegas was rather well known, and both Los Angeles Times and San Francisco Chronicle came to cover it. And it was clearly stated, Ukrainian composer, blah, 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 blah. The critic from the San Francisco Chronicle wrote the premiere, not, it was not a premiere, he made that mistake because it was first performed already in another place, but the performance of Spectre by the Russian composer Valentin Silvestro. And I right away wrote to him. I said, why Russian? I said it was Ukrainian. Oh, it doesn't make any difference. Everybody knows that Ukraine is part of Russia. Okay? This was a known fact. My complaint against the Oscola is that not a fight was established about that. Yes, we wrote our papers. We wrote our things, mostly, by the way, in Ukrainian which was a waste of time, in my opinion. Not really. I don't mean it was a waste of time. But the, the book should be in English. In English. Because it's the lingua franca of the world right now. They will read about it if it's in English. They will not learn Ukrainian to read it. And I think the mistakes were made were multiple, which is what I try to address. And that was over a long period of time that we, we sort of refused to fight the outside world. We did our work inside in that igloo and didn't really worry too much about what was said from the outside. And if the outside was negative, well, they hate us, that's all. There's nothing we can do about it. Let me give you another example. Right now, we know about Israel and this, the whole idea of Palestinians. There are many Jews who considered the treatment of Palestinian as wrong. There was a recent article in the New York Times about a creation of a group that considered that should be made clear any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. I'm not saying we need to go that far, but that kind of an absolute defense of who we are and who we, what we produce and how we publish it, and how we present it, is very important. This was not done. When this whole idea came up, when I joined the, the organization, said we should do more in English, yeah, 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 but things were beginning to get done. But also who publishes it is important. The quality of the publisher is extremely important. Okay? And so I think there are many things that we need to think about that we generally don't. So we get, you know, most universities, six universities, this university publishes something for us. They do nothing to advertise it. Absolutely nula, nula. If you had any experience with university publications, they don't do it. They publish it, yeah, and that's enough for them. And it's enough for the professor because they get merit and then they get promoted. And the story ends there. And I'm saying we have to get out of that. I love Anton Varga's presentation, as well as Adriana showing us all these problems. And Mudrak, of course, wonderful presentation. I'm going to tell all my friends that they have to watch it to find out about Ukrainian art. Ukrainian art has suffered more, actually, than even Ukrainian music has, in terms of being Russian. They don't want to let go of it because it made a world effect. It impressed the world. And we got to take it back. And we should fight every... And I mean, 
you know, I love Madrak say me giving a pep talk. No, it's not a pep talk. You know, in the squad, in the army, there's a point person. It's way ahead, maybe 50, 60 hours ahead. That's the person that gets killed first. We, if we choose, are the point persons. And we will get hit over the head very hard. Do you think the Russians are going to give this up without a fight? Ah! You don't understand reality then. That's all I wanted to make a comment. Bravo, people. I'm very happy to be among you. Hey, other reactions from the, from the panelists? I want to just give you a, a chance to just give a few thoughts in response. Hmm? I think I, I'll just say that, you know, Antisha has really done a tremendous job in creating a sense of Ukrainian identity. One of the elements of academia is to deconstruct those narratives and to create spaces for dialogue of conflicting ideas. And I think this is where Ukrainian studies as an, as an entity has not yet been able to engage fully because they've been so worried and concerned about building Ukraine. What I think this war, at least for myself, I'm just speaking for myself as a scholar, it's giving me a sense that I can um, engage with as a solid entity, and then I don't have to do this build on the one hand and deconstruct on the other. And I think that is also what's going to help me present this to younger scholars. And we'll see this, we'll, we'll see the, and we've already started to see the impact of, of uh, undergraduates changing their research uh, focus for their final projects uh, and, and looking at Ukraine. And, and you know, this, this will have a tremendous impact, but again, it takes some time. And again, to Virko's point, there are generational responses to this as well. So just to really recognize that a 20 year old is perceiving this very differently from somebody in their mid career or um, in, 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 other, in other parts of their career. Uh, if I could just add, um, uh, if I could just add, I think uh, we need to realize as well that um, you know, this is a generational thing. And um, our efforts uh, are going to bring about a transition. They have to. Uh, I know in the museum field, uh, suddenly the world's museums uh, realize that Ukraine has an art history uh, and they're interested in exhibitions. Uh, but these exhibitions have to be not like what MoMA is doing who after so many decades of asking them to label their works properly, uh, finally they brought out works by artists from Ukraine and had a, a support Ukraine exhibition. That's great, but it could be very, very temporary and very useless as a result. Uh, there has to be a systemic change. And so I think the systemic change is coming because I get inquiries from my students who are now curators who say, how do I write this artist's name? Because in our museum records, it's written this way. Uh, but uh, the Institute of Culture in Kyiv uh, is attacking this head on. Um, there was, uh, we had a meeting that they really need to be the central source for identifying uh, the place names, the correct uh, spelling of Ukrainian artists so that museums around the world would go to that single source uh, if there is any question. I think that's one kind of very practical way uh, that we are making a change in the kind of institutional um, display and inventorying of Ukrainian artists. Uh, but there have to be exhibitions that are contextualized, uh, just pulling together everything that you can find in your storage of uh, that of artists coming from Ukraine is just not gonna do it. Uh, I think you have to make connections, make people understand. I mean, the trend is now for thematic exhibitions anyway. Uh, we can return to stylistic exhibitions uh, or finding stylistic influences as well uh, on which 20th century art history was built uh, initially. So uh, there's a lot of work ahead. 
but but it has but we have to see uh, probably our generation as kind of setting the tone uh, for re-educating or directing uh, the understanding of a generation that is following us. And hopefully that's going to really bring about a, a complete uh, turnaround in what I consider a complete complacency. I, I'm sure that in many, uh, in many departments, there's still a lot of um, um, uh, Russo fields who you know, have been trained on uh, white army, uh, arist aristocratic histories of, of Russia, uh, but they're dying out. They're dying out and, and we have to understand that they will die out. Uh, but we have to replenish that field with uh, you know, the kind of history that uh, balances it out. And, uh, and I think publications like Pluhis are a, a great step in this direction. Uh, so I think maybe in other fields as well, uh, we can begin to turn the tide. Okay, um, I'd like to give Antonio the chance to just make an observation really quick. And then there's a few more questions that are coming in. Yeah, so I'll, like I'll just a little those. alter the, uh, the, the words of uh, Pani Mudrak uh, about MoMA. In 2019, MoMA published such a book, such a book uh, uh, research about Eastern European art, contemporary Eastern European art. And can you, and in the end of the book, they had a map where all the curators from MoMA came, where, they, where, where all of them, where all of them went to Europe, to Eastern Europe, what countries? And can you imagine on this Eastern European map, there was only three like white spots that the places where, where they didn't go, curators of MoMA, like working on this Eastern European uh, uh, book about Eastern European art. They didn't go to Ukraine, they didn't go to Belarus, they didn't go to Moldova. And look what we have now, right? Is it like, it, it just, it, it's exactly where politics, where all these inst in, in institutions on the West, when they like, it, exactly when they countering the culture, you know, and what we have in the result. And yeah, that, that's why it also, I'm um, just my, again, uh, that's why it was also for us important to cast a shadow over the over the gardens, you know, not just to make a show, but cast a shadow of Ukrainian artists. Uh, yeah, that was just my uh, small small remark. Great. Um, so, um, I'm going to just go ahead and ask a couple of questions, and then ask people to respond, and you can make an observation then if you'd like to. So, um, a question from Lesia Brandman, who is um, a Brandman, who is a member of Antisha. She says, "Dear panelists, in your opinion, what could be done to present more Ukrainian classical music on American classical radio stations?" Um, this is something that that um, is on everyone's mind, and probably is more directed at the music folks. Um, and then I'm just going to ask another second question. Um, I'm going to save a third one for later, but the second question is, um, the past few weeks is from Yuri Anshishin, who's uh, also a member of the arts section. He says an increasing press has, increasingly the press has focused on the destruction of Ukrainian culture as part of the war, and the war offers an opportunity not only for informing the general public, but also to preserve what's left of Ukrainian culture, um, which requires education and funding. So those are two, two questions to anyone who'd like to address them. Go ahead, Virko. Yeah. Okay, I think the, the first thing everybody is talking about, finally, I, I've heard too many Ukrainians say, well, we've, we've done the work. You see now Ukrainian has attention. No, we haven't done the work. Ukraine got attention because it got invaded. And we got to remember that. So we should not pat ourselves on the back too much as far as the general knowledge of the public goes. Have we done a great deal of work within the study, the semantics, and all of this? Yes. All of us here sitting have done work to participate in that. But it took the war to bring attention to it. But they didn't know what to do with it. Some of you may know the name Alex Ross. Alex Ross is a very famous musicologist, to some extent, reviewer, publicist of music. He wrote an article about reaction to Ukraine and Ukrainian music, supposedly, 
the New York Times, I think, no, or was it uh, the New Yorker? Basically, he started talking about Prokofiev because he was born in Ukraine and because he did an opera on Ukrainian subject. And Shostakovich, as if he didn't know about all the others, about Latoshinsky, about, about uh, 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 Silvestro, about Hrabowski. I can, cause I, don't, I can go down the line of all kinds of things. You didn't know Lubina, oh, exactly. All this stuff is like, didn't exist. Part of it has to do with, again, that we do not perform within the public domain of the American culture. I keep harping on this because that point is lost. We try to get the money, let's get the money to support a publication by a major publisher, by Macmillan, by Koff and others, the ones that will push the books, that have the money to do that. And eventually to get reviewers to tackle them. That has happened. We have had that. Certainly Ascot has been successful in getting some books reviewed properly and all that. So we can do that, but we must understand where the power is. I'm still feeling we're trying to hide behind something that I don't think is legitimate. As far as how do we do this? By underwriting it. Most of radio stations in America are funded by people. You send to WXY, whatever it is, QXR, a nice check together with some recordings, they'll play them. Sorry, this is the way it is. Money speaks. Otherwise, it won't work. Well, Nathan Milstein came, he's from Odessa originally, great violinist, to the United States. I believe it was Hurok who was given $30,000 and said, by who? By the Jewish community, and said, make him famous. He's great. There are all kinds of ways of doing things that we need to explore, which we have sort of denied ourselves. Part of it say, we don't have enough money for that. Well, let's find money for that. Right now, Ukraine is in a good position, we in the diaspora, to get American money for it. But we got to get professionals to look for it. You know, finding a Ukrainian who can do that. If there was Ukrainians who could do it, they would have done it by now. We need to find somebody who will do it. That's my point. I think we can't retreat from that position. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to say something uh, about uh, monuments. Um, well, first of all, Tenzin Hudson is, is putting together a book now called Treasures of Ukraine. And it's going uh, on a very fast track. Uh, I was asked to write something uh, within a week's time and send it, and uh, they've edited now, so they're moving along very quickly. Uh, but the other thing about monuments, um, the Ukrainian uh, um, cultural, the instant culture is keeping an, a log of destruction, <clears throat> uh, which is an Excel sheet. Uh, with date of destruction, what kind of destruction, and with photos of destruction. Uh, and it's being added to every day. It's a, it's a really important source. Uh, and it's very easy to use and to understand. So uh, there is that kind of work being done and they're on it. Uh, so, and I, I think there are, yesterday I was on a panel uh, with uh, legal scholars and uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, the destruction of monuments and where it falls in terms of cultural genocide. So these are, are these are discussions that we need to be following and be participating in. Um, so that's just a comment. Great. Um, so there, there's one more um, question. Actually, this is um, uh, from Amy Ann Volk. And the question is, I'm going to summarize here. Um, which colleges and universities in the U.S. are known for the doing well by Ukraine in terms of, of funding, I guess, Ukrainian studies and with educators and administration who are 
well informed. Um, so are there any places that uh, are doing good things that could be emulated and where um, you know Ukrainian scholars might feel at home? You can go ahead and just jump in. Um, I think I, I saw that question in the chat and there was reference to uh, Rama Prima Bohachowska and I also just wanted to acknowledge her memory and her long-term influence. Um, her granddaughter actually goes to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I've been thinking, you know, what is the responsibility of those who are on the administrative side, those that are faculty and students? You know, up to now in universities, it's been the Ukrainian clubs that have been pushing and representing. And one of the ways uh, from the history of music, how uh, the first African-American jazz uh, music professor was hired, there was a sit-in. Um, at the chancellor's office where all the African-American students on campus went and sat in the president's office, it was 50 years ago, and did not leave until a tenured professor was hired. Um, so that type of activism has already had a lot of repercussions um, and, and positive um, uh, influence um, you know, in, in university settings. Uh, but as, as Virko was saying, and as we we're saying, it, it has to do with the funding. Uh, you know, we're looking at Columbia. We, we depend on Harvard a lot. You have University of, of Alberta. Um, you know, numerous individual uh, places where there are, are faculty members who are aware. Um, and I think simply, we simply have to continue funding the younger scholars because they are the ones who are able to negotiate these um, stories and these theories and, and to work beyond Slavic studies, right? So the, a career in Slavic studies now for Ukrainian is, is still very difficult. If you're able to move beyond and see those narratives in other uh, disciplines um, and, and create uh, parallels, right? So not to look at Ukraine as an exceptional case, but to look as a decolonial space that you can compare to uh, African narratives, that you can show uh, parallels with Latin American experiences, with South Asian experiences, those then respond and resonate. So the way that I present Ukrainian music actually is through the realm of African-American, um, you know, anti-establishment narratives. This is how people actually understand and, and how I teach uh, the Ukrainian um, story. It's, it's not through Ukraine itself, or it's not through Ukraine and Russia. That tends to go to an audience that wouldn't be able to respond or to help. Um, Hip hop, that resonates. So that's uh, something that I can add to that. And if I were to give advice to a grad to a prospective graduate student who wants to do studies in um, on the topic of Ukraine, it's not so much the institution; it's the individual. Uh, find the person whose writings you are following, uh, whose presentations you're listening to at conferences, and become an advisee. Have that person be your mentor. Uh, that is the best way that you can actually do. Uh, fulfill your interest and be attached institutionally, and then you just make your own way uh, because there's no reason for good talent to be fighting administrations and, and systems, uh, but you sh we should be doing creative work. And the best way to do it is to attach yourself to a good mentor. Great. Um... Any any final thoughts? I think we, we really only have time for one more observation. So um, maybe Virko, I'll give you the final word and then I'll bring this panel to a close. Uh, you're muted, so go ahead and- I'm, I'm muted right now. Look, uh, in terms of bringing faculty in and things along that line, uh, Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Las Vegas has three Ukrainians on the music faculty. Besides me, there's Mikola Suk, was really internationally known pianist and a young conductor, relatively young in relation to me, Taras Kresa. Now, the one thing I have, generally speaking, about most Ukrainian performers, there are exceptions. They don't perform enough Ukrainian music. Um, there is still that kind of a reluctance to take on a major piece and perform it. You have to be able to do that. 
Um, when I did the Las Vegas Symphony, we, we did Lutoshinsky's Second Symphony. And um, in Toronto, not Toronto, Winnipeg, I did Lutoshinsky's Third Movement of that. You have to be able to take that on and do it. Um, you know, pl playing short, easy pieces is not in it. Pavel Gintov is also a pianist that does that a lot, is interested in getting into all of that. And I think um, uh, Miroslava's point about mentorship and all that, I think is very, very important. Remember, how do you become a Supreme Court justice? By working with a Supreme Court justice, by bringing them coffee, correcting their spelling, and doing all that other good stuff, okay? That's what you have to do. That's not a, a denobling job. It is ennobling job. You learn what it's like to be a power source. Again, we need to learn how to be a power source. I feel like this <laughs> voice in the desert when it comes to this. We hide from that. We're scared of that. We really have believed the PR that we are little Russians. I'm saying get away from that. We are truly great Rus. That's what we should say. And take that back. And I think the things that Miroslava is talking about, about this book coming out, which is going to be pushed. It needs to be pushed. Coming out is not enough. It really isn't. Anybody can do a concert. Anybody can. But getting it reviewed, getting it listened to, having it an influence. Get foreigners to do it. Almost all the New York concerts that I was involved with, I worked with Juilliard on that, with Joel Sachs. It made a big difference. Critics came. So my, my point to you again is there this is not inventing the wheel. It's simply recognizing what a wheel is. I thought Thank you guys you. did fantastic jobs. I learned so much today. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you so much to all of you for um, sharing your thoughts with us. And thanks to our um, listeners and viewers for sticking with us. Um, this this panel uh, has gone over and uh, I can say that it's not for lack of uh, ideas. It's for because it's there's so many ideas um, that have really been brought out today. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I would like to just remind you that the Shevchenko Scientific Society is organizing um, a fundraiser um, to support our colleagues who have been affected by the war, scholars, writers, and artists. Um, so for more information on that, please visit www.shevchenko.org and click on the Shevchenko Emergency Fund. Um, so thanks for being with us and um, all the best. Thank you. Thank you.